one of the greatest psalms is Psalm 23. Because in this old psalm, which is really the psalm of psalms, uh, David pauses uh, and he talks about how does, a, how does a Christian get rejuvenated? I mean, how do you get uh, re-energized to go out into the wicked world and, and live for God? Uh, and he's going to write his thoughts down as a former shepherd uh, in Psalm 23. This is a very famous psalm. I mean, many Christians and even non-Christians can quote it. Uh, my mother-in-law, before she passed away, I was in her bedroom one night, one afternoon talking to her. And, uh, and you know, and, and I said, well, what have, what have been like the famous uh, scriptures that, uh, you know, imprinted on your soul? And she was looking at her mortality. She said, well, I've always, I've always enjoyed since I was a child, Psalm 23, that whenever I read it and quoted it, it always gave me great peace and comfort. Um, I've heard from uh, my dad's uh, friends uh, who were Marines uh, who, who uh, went to Iwo Jima on the landing barges. Uh, many of them knew this particular psalm, and they could quote it as those gates came down. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Uh, many young men and women have said this going into battle. Uh, many people have quoted this going into surgery, uh, that the Lord is my shepherd, meaning he's going to be with me. It's going to be okay. Uh, people that have gone through great trials and tribulation have found much comfort in this old psalm. And what this psalm does, if you boil it down to its main idea, is, is David's going to challenge us here uh, with this particular motif. Here's the motif. Uh, we need to remember, because he's going to call us to remember who God is and what he's done for us. And as you remember who God is and what he's done for you, you're renewed by definition of that knowledge because he's with you. And so you might need to be renewed. A lot of uh, people, when they come to church on a, on a given uh, Lord's Day, uh, they tell me that it just felt right to be here. Uh, last week, uh, I talked to one of our young ladies who hadn't been here since we uh, had to close the worship doors for months. And I said, well, you know, how was worship today? And she said, I sat here and, and listened. And, and then as we started singing, I, I started crying. I started getting teary-eyed because it felt so right to be in the building. I can tell you, as I preached here for months to an empty room with the lights off, that was not optimal. That was really hard. And I remember the very first Sunday that we allowed people to come back into the building just to see some people. It was so awesome. Uh, and it just felt right. And that's what my wife said when we saw people worshiping God together corporately. You just felt like your life came to center. Uh, not center, as I and in. ER, but center. All right, you got it? Um, but we want to get renewed when we come into this place. So how do we get renewed? Uh, David's going to tell us here in this psalm to remember three things. Number one, I'm going to give you the sermon outline before we go through it, so you do not get lost, all right? It's only six verses. Uh, what do we need to remember? Three things. Number one, we need to remember God's person. Who is he? Who is he? That's Psalm 23, verse 1, A. We need to understand God's provision so we know who he is. That leads to he acts in our life. That's his provision. That's the heart of the psalm, verses 1b uh, through uh, chapter 5, or uh, verse 5. And then God's plan. What's his plan? So he has his person. Uh, he provides for us, but then he has a plan for us. Verse 6 is the climax of the entire psalm, uh, and he's going to focus us on verse 6. In fact, I don't think you can really understand Psalm 23 unless you understand the import of verse 6. Because he's going to say in verse 6, just to skip ahead, surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. That's part of God's provision. And then in, at the last part of verse 6, he tells you what's the purpose of God. He says, well, the purpose is that I would dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That I would have an intimacy with God that's like an eternal intimacy. From the Old Testament perspective, this is like intimacy with God in his temple. In the New Testament perspective, it's like intimacy with God in his church, in corporate worship that were designed for corporate worship. And so we were going to read this psalm and study the psalm through the, the lens of how David put it together, that who God is, his person, how he provides for us, his goal, his purpose is to get us into a place of corporate worship where we realize corporately all these great things God does for us. doesn't mean that there's not an individual application to these uh, texts as we're going to see. But first and foremost, he's saying, I just want to stand in the temple of God forever and worship him. Uh, when I was a high school uh, pastor, uh, a young student came up to me and said, uh, what are we going to do in heaven all day? <laughs> Don't you love high school students? And, and, then, and then I said, well, what do you mean what are we going to do? And she said, well, isn't it going to be boring? What do you think I told her? Boring? Let me explain to you. I mean, just to stand in God's presence and behold his glory would be enough for about a thousand years, right? You know, and I began to explain to her, and then, then that, you know, put her, her fears to rest. 
Uh, so we want to look at uh, who God is and, and, and then understand how he has blessed and provided for us. And then what our purpose is as a church is to continue to be the kind of church that Paul or that uh, David talks about here. God's person, verse 1. Who is he? First, David says, uh, I wrote this psalm, which means we've lost the music for it. We don't know what it is, but we, we know what the lyrics are. What are the lyrics? You, you know the lyrics, even if I turn the slide off. What are the lyrics? The Lord is what? He's my shepherd. He's whose shepherd? Whose shepherd is he? He's your shepherd. This is, this is stunning. Uh, first, understand who God is. So it's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Which name of God is that? Well, that's the name Yahweh. Who's that? Well, that, that's the great covenant God. That's the eternal God. See, this is the, the concept that Yahweh is the concept of uh, Exodus chapter 3, 14, when Moses wants to know the name of God. I'm going to go tell Israel that I talked with God, you know, in this burning bush. What's your name? God says, God, okay, I'll give you my name. It says in verse 14, and God said to Moses, this is my name. I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Remember, I told you this before, uh, review's a wonderful thing, uh, that God's name is a verb. Why? Because he's ontologically always existent. He's outside of time and space. He's the uncaused one. I mean, as a child, I always wondered, you know, cause and effect. I got it as a child. I mean, so it leads to the natural question, which all children want to know. Mommy, who made God? Answer, no one made God. God is the origin of all things. He's the uncaused one. And so when, when you look at Psalm 23, David starts out by saying, do not forget who he is. He's the Lord that is your shepherd, the Lord, the, the eternal one. See, he's the one that out of, out of his mouth spoke uh, all of our world into existence, the entire cosmos, with his creative word according to Genesis 1. And the thing is, if he is that great, he's that powerful, he's omniscient, he's om omnipresent. If this is who he is, as the, 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 the verb, the I am, what is there to worry about? And the other thing to understand is, if that's how great God is, and it is, he calls himself by what metaphor? Shepherd. I'm your shepherd. Now, he could be super busy, super busy, could he not? You just try to get an appointment with somebody who's super, super powerful and famous and see how quickly you can get in to see them. And it's going to be a while. God says, no, I am, I'm constantly, as the great I am, your shepherd. He could have said, I'm the king, I'm the CEO, I'm the big man, uh, uh, whatever. But he said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm your shepherd. And he makes it personal to say, I am your shepherd. So on any given day, no matter where you are, if you're in a doctor's office waiting to get a, a report from the doctor, some tests they ran, if you're waiting for a job interview and you're nervous, you can be sitting there and saying to the Lord, the God of all the cosmos, I am so thankful that you are my shepherd. Because that means that you're here with me today and you have all the power to help me in my situation. David uh, knew a lot about this metaphor, didn't he? Because what was his job occupation before? He was a king. He was a shepherd. David understood what it was like to deal with sheep. And so he taps into that concept, and he knows what the job description of a, of a shepherd is. So what does a shepherd do? What's the job description of a shepherd? What's he got to do? You tell me. What's he got to do? He's got to keep track of the sheep. That's a tough one. Because what do sheep do by definition? Oh, look, there's a shiny object. Yeah, yeah. They just kind of wander off. Uh, so he's got to take care of the sheep. He's got to feed the sheep. He's got to protect the sheep. He's got to break them up when they're fighting as they bite each other, Right? He's got to check them for disease, heal their wounds. If they get lost, what's he supposed to do? Oh, I'm missing one. I had a hundred. I'm missing one. What's he supposed to do when he loses one? He's got to go find them. He's got to go find them. So the job description of a shepherd, David understood this, and he applies this to God. But really, the ultimate shepherd, from what we know of the New Testament revelation, is the ultimate shepherd is who? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate shepherd. See, when, when God Yahweh becomes God man, Jesus... What metaphor does he take for himself? Shepherd. John 10. I love John 10. It's a comforting passage. Uh, Jesus says uh, here, you want to know who I am? Well, he's, he's the great I am. That's what he says in John 8. Uh, but here he says, uh, as the great I am, also understand that as I was the shepherd to David, well, I am the good shepherd to you. I am the good shepherd. The good, which means if there's a good shepherd, there's bad shepherds, right? 
He said, no, I'm the good one. I'm the one you can count on. He says, the good shepherd gives his life for his sheep, but a hireling, uh, he is one who's not a shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. Uh, that's like Israel's bad shepherds. But the hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. Jesus says, uh, contrary to the bad shepherds, like the Pharisees, I'm the good shepherd. Uh, notice the I am statement. Jesus says in the Greek, I am perpetually that good shepherd. He says, I know my sheep and, and, and I'm known, uh, known by my own. I know my sheep. Which means when the Lord looks down from heaven, if you're his sheep, and by the way, that's a whole other sermon, a job security for me. How do you get to become a sheep of God? Because we all start out as what kind of animal according to scripture? Goats. You're either a goat because you don't know God or you're a sheep. And it says in Matthew 25, one day when Jesus appears, he separates the two. You're mine, you're not mine. You're mine, you're not mine. How do you become a sheep? Because we're not all, all born sheep. You, you trust in the shepherd, Jesus, as your savior. At that moment of faith, uh, you, you get saved and, and you move from being a goat to being a sheep in God's kingdom. If you've not ever done that, I challenge you. Greatest decision you'll ever make is to follow the shepherd. Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd which means he's going to be there and know you as a sheep. So on any given day, no matter what you're facing, David says, the, the greatness about God is he knows you. He knows you. Think about how busy he is. I mean, go read Job and what happened to Job and, and all the trials and tribulations to Job. And then it, it, when God finally shows up, I mean, start reading around chapter 38. When God finally shows up, it, he basically tells Job, who do you think you are to question me when I'm running the entire cosmos, feeding every bird, every animal, moving every storm across the, the land, I, bringing rain? I'm busy. I, I got my eye on you. See, God knows you because he has his eye on you, and he knows who you are, uh, and he can care for you. David says, the Lord is my shepherd. He's your sh shepherd. Has God not been our shepherd as, as a church? Indeed he has. Remember verse 6? David's wanting to dwell in God's house for all eternity, his church as it were, uh, his temple. He said, I just want that intimacy to be there because I know who you are. When I look at it as the pastor, who I'm an under shepherd under Christ, but I can look back and say, over the years, God has been awesome in caring for this church. He's been the shepherd of this church through valleys, tough times, and through great times, and we want to thank him. But that's what God's person is. In fact, the more you understand the, God, the person of God, the greater you can understand how to follow that God and the greater peace you'll have. What does God do as our shepherd? Well, that's verses uh, one to five. Uh, we want to remember his provision. What is his provision? Uh, think about it. Let's read it. It says, this is a Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not what? Want. I shall not want. Um, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup, as I know you, God, runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. These are the provisions of God. Uh, we want to touch upon what this is because God says, I, I, my person is a shepherd. But as a shepherd, here's what I do for my people. Here's what I do for my church. Let's click it down through them. I shall not want. Did you go shopping this weekend? Did you? I went to Costco yesterday. I don't usually go on a Sunday. We had some wants. We went there. Mistake. The whole world was at Costco. See, you can't go through a given day and not have a want. So what is, what is he saying when he says the, the shepherd uh, is there to, to help us? And David says, because of that, I, I have no wants. Well, what does he mean by that? Because we know we, by definition, have many wants in life. Things that, that come our way that we want. Um, what I think he's saying here is, uh, what, he's, what he's getting at, is with God as your shepherd, uh, on, at any given time, uh, you will never have an instance in your life uh, where he will not be there to provide for you. Never. That you won't have a want, no matter if it's a bad medical report, a surgical procedure that didn't go correctly, uh, whatever it is, you lost your job, what, whatever it is, that God is going to show up eventually and meet your need. You're not going to be without want. doesn't mean that you're not going to have trial and tribulation, 
but that he's going to always be there for you to provide for you. I mean, think about uh, Stephen when he was uh, uh, martyred for the faith. As they're getting ready to, to kill him, and they're picking up stones to throw at him, and as those stones begin to hit his body, he looks up into heaven, and what does he see? Well, he, the heavens open, and he, he sees the Father on the throne and the Son standing by him, uh, and he, he sees where he's going. What happened at that moment? He's being pelted by stones for his faith, by angry Jewish leaders, for da- him daring to speak about Christ the Messiah, and he looks up into heaven and sees the, the shepherd himself who had risen to greet him. See, he met his need at that moment. God will always be there for you uh, no matter what. It doesn't mean that you won't face difficulty because God uses difficulty to hone the soul, does he not? I mean, adversity hones the soul. The older you get, the more you understand the value of adversity. Uh, pearl cannot become a pearl unless what? It goes through great ordeal. A diamond can't become a diamond unless it goes through a great ordeal uh, to become a diamond. Uh, even, even your own... Um, China in your, in your cabinet that you might bring out at Christmas and Easter. Uh, is the, it's different than your normal tableware uh, by definition of how many times they put that China in the kiln. The heat makes it what it is. So God's not saying you'll never have a situation uh, where all of your needs will be met and all your wants will be met. No. But he's going to be there for you at the end of the day to show up like he did for Stephen to, to, to provide for whatever it is that you need. Number two. He said he makes me to lie down in green pastures plural. He makes me. I think he wrote this for people in D.C. He makes you. Because what are people in D.C. like? Or what were they like kind of like pre-coronavirus? I, I couldn't even hardly pull out of my complex on the Braddock Road because car after car after car. I mean, everybody's going. Now it's cool. I, there's no one. I just pull out. Um, but but it, with driven people, busy people, heavy schedules, he, he knows you have no margin in your life. The book of your life is all filled in. And God looks down from heaven as the, as the shepherd and says to you, individually and corporately, you need to relax. You need to slow down. You need to have some silence and solitude. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. What, what are those pastures? Um, Based on verse 6, the way I interpret this, where David is looking for intimacy in the temple of God, I think the green pasture is first and foremost a, a, a place of worship. The place, this place of worship. This is like you come into corporate worship with other believers, and it's like you came to a, an awesome place for feeding. It's a green pasture that God's going to feed you. Uh, and the word here for green pasture in Hebrew refers to tall grass, something that freaks me out as a gardener. Right? I mean, I mowed my lawn on Friday, and then Liz went to go do some things yesterday, uh, and I was going to work out in the backyard and stuff. And so when I came home, she asked me, did you mow the front yard again? I'm not that insane, but I actually did think about it because uh, I saw a little bit of growth from a day. So when I was interpreting this is, this is, this is week from the Hebrew, and it says it's really long grass. Oh, but it's awesome, isn't it? God says, I'm, I'm not going to just put you where it's, the grass is cut low. I'm going to put you in a field where it's really high. And when I think of the church, that is exactly what you have here. When you walk into this place of worship, uh, you should be feeding on uh, food that God puts there for you, which is easy to, to identify what the food is. What is the food that's available in this place? Two things. Worship of the living God feeds the soul, and the word of God teaches you. Teaches you. Feeds your soul. Uh, the Bible is food. First Corinthians 3, uh, Paul calls it milk. And it's also meat in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 to 14. It's milk and meat for the Christian to grow and to learn from. And as you walk into this place, God's feeding you with ample food. And we try to give you food, milk for the new Christians and then meat for the older Christians. And so how many have come in here sometimes and walked away and thought, okay, that was totally over my head, that one whole section. Has that ever happened? Don't, don't tell me. It might depress me, but... Now, has it happened to you? You're like, what in the world? But have you not walked away and thought, God just totally talked to me? I mean, one guy came up to me one time in a service and said, I feel like you and I during the service are just having a private conversation. He said, could you quit, could you quit doing that? I go, well, that's, that's not me. That's the spirit of God. See, the, God was taking that man and all of his issues and laying him down in the green grass of the word of God and worship of the living God. And he's feeding his soul. He's feeding his soul. Who has not been fed when you've come in here? Uh, It's a place of feeding. That's the green pasture. 
He says, he also leads me as the shepherd beside still waters. Who wants to relax next, next to a Category 5 river? Who, who wants to? I mean, if you've been busy here in D.C., you don't want to go on vacation and sit next down to a five, Category 5 river. Why? Pretty simple. What's the problem with Category 5? It's really loud. That's not restful. What's restful? Well, I went this summer uh, out to see the grandkids. We went to Lake Tahoe because it's by my daughter's house. Stayed on one of my friend's property, have a private gate, private place, private beach. Awesome. And they're sitting there on the beach one day. It's a, at the beach is, I don't even know, 300 yards long. I was the only person on the beach. I'm just sitting there, and the clouds are uh, here and there coming over the lake, and the sun hitting the, the lake. It's beautiful. The water's clear blue. I'm sitting out there with my Bible and just reading the Word of God and taking it all in. I mean, talk about a place for rest and relaxation to restore the soul. Uh, who put me there? Well, the shepherd put me there. God made it available for me to go there. And, and he says, that, think of who I am. I'm the one who leads you to places where it's still water. It's, it's like that water lapping on the beach. Uh, our friends, the way they uh, built this, this, this home, um, the master bedroom windows uh, are right on the lake. And, and so at night when you open the windows, the slider door and everything at night, it, you, just, you go to bed hearing the water lapping up against the lake. I, you want to retire there, right? It's just, oh, this is like therapeutic. See, God does that for you. He puts you in situations where you will, you will have to fill the need to rest that's what I think in light of the passage is what worship is. Worship, corporate worship, which David says in Psalm 23, 6, I want to dwell in God's house forever. I want to have that intimacy that I'm just, I love being with his people and worshiping him. He says that's a place ultimately for rest for me when I come here and I just relax, rest in the worship, rest in the word of God. He's focused on the temple. He saw, also says here that he, re, he, he leads me beside still waters, which the, the waters could easily be uh, uh, the, the word of life. Because Jesus uh, told the woman at the well, you seek to find water that lasts for a moment. But if you drink of me, the living water, you will never thirst again. See, Jesus is that, that still water. And as you come and worship him in corporate worship, feeds the soul and, and quenches your spiritual thirst and prepares you for the week ahead. Uh, he also says he restores my soul. This is an, a, a participle that uh, is, a, is an imperfect, denoting a, a, continual, a continual action. He restores your soul. And you could do an entire sermon series on why would a Christian soul need to get restored? Well, think of all the things that can happen to you in a given week that drain your soul. Um, many things. Uh, tragedies that you face. Uh, lost one. Uh, my pastoral mentor, Dr. Al Van Salo, that I've known since, I don't know, early 70s, uh, and uh, pastored the largest church in Stockton, and then eventually uh, went to Hawaii and Seattle and, and led, it was pastor of big churches. When I was a church planter, he came to my church when he retired and came up to me one day. I hadn't seen him, I don't even know, 15 years or more. He came up to me and said, hey, Marty, and I'm like, whoa, and he said, hey, I'm retired. I came back to town. Uh, would you like me to have, uh, would you like me to be on staff with you for free? There's just some things you don't need to pray about, right? Uh, he had a doctorate, two, two master's degrees, an army chaplain in Vietnam, great man of God. Uh, God called him home last week, last Saturday. Great man of God. Uh, he, he's, he impacted me. In fact, he prepared me to come here, uh, is, is what he did, as he counseled me on on this church and what I should do with my life and following God's leading. But when you think about the loss of a loved one, um, th this can weigh heavy on the soul. Uh, but God says, when you grieve, I restore your soul. It doesn't mean that he's going to keep you from grief, but he restores the soul. He pours back into you and gives you great joy in a moment of, of, of great excitement as you think about how God restores you. Last night uh, after dinner, Nathan pulled out a TV, uh, set it in the, in the, in the, the den, uh, got out some old tapes of things he had shot over the years of the family, uh, and we went back and reminisced of, of family trips and things with my mom, my dad, in South Carolina and stuff. Seeing old things, wow, I can't believe how young we were. Um, and you go back and look at all the old videos, and, and I saw my father in many of those. And you remember his humor and the way he talked and all those things. And it's, when we went to bed last night, I told Liz, it's like to watch something like that is sad, but it's also restorative, isn't it? Because God says, I'm going to use a little video to restore your soul. David says, that's what God is like. He takes your soul that's battered and he restores it. And as we think about verse 6, he does it through worship, that you get restored when you come to worship. He also says he takes you through the valley of the shadow of death, 
And that as you go through the valley of the shadow of death, you're going to fear no evil. Uh, when my best friend Rick Seeley was dying from cancer, pancreatic cancer, the, he was the sheriff, the homicide uh, captain. And we did final communion for him when he was near death. And we were all doing communion in his living room. And we all started crying because we knew this was the last time we'd do communion with Rick. He didn't cry. And I asked Rick afterward, I said, hey man, you're facing your own mortality. And we're all sobbing our eyes out. How can you be so peaceful? And he, and he said, uh, hey, none of us are getting out of here alive. Thank you for encouraging me as a homicide captain. Uh, that's what he told me. Uh, but, but think about it. What did Rick understand? Rick under, understood that he was just merely facing a shadow. When my mom's uh, mother, my, my grandma Allery, was dying, I called one night uh, to the hospital in La Jolla, uh, and she was not uh, coherent, so I wasn't planning on getting her. I knew she was near the end. Uh, and so I let the phone ring a couple times because my mom and her sister were in, in the, had taken shifts taking care of her. Uh, and the, uh, the phone was picked up, and it kind of jiggled around like somebody was having a hard time picking it up. And um, so I was waiting for my Aunt Roberta to say hello, my mom's sister. And my grandma answered. <laughs> she, had, she wasn't in a position to answer a phone cognitively. And I got to talk to her. Last time I ever talked to her. Don't tell me that wasn't planned. And, and I got to talk to her. And one of the things that she told me was, I said, Grandma, how are you feeling? She said, well, I, I'm going through the valley of shadow of death. But what does that mean? Well, I have nothing to fear. See, it's that, it's that going through the valley of shadow of death. Whoever f- feared a shadow you shouldn't. Why? Has anybody ever been attacked by a shadow? No? No? No. Shadow can't do anything to you. See, the shadow is just there. It's, it, it's just, you know, something bright and with light is making the shadow, but the shadow is nothing. David says, if God is your, is your shepherd, the author of life itself, the true shepherd who gave his life for the sheep and rose the third day, and you're facing death, why are you fearful? Well, you shouldn't be, because he's with you, even through the valley. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Why? Because even when you face death itself, he's with you. That's why the old hymn says, on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is what? Sinking sand. It's sinking sand. Because he says, when God is your shepherd, when you understand his person, then his provision for you is perfect. It's perfect. It's perfect. He says, your rod and your staff, God, they comfort me. What is the rod of a shepherd used for? Well, it's basically two things. A weapon to to fend off uh, predators. Uh, It was also used as the shepherd would look at his sheep because their wool is very dense. He could take the rod and push it into the wool and move it back and forth, and he could look for disease. So he could protect his sheep from wolves, and he could also look at their lives and see if there was any disease he needed to treat. Uh, he says, your rod and your, 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 your staff, they, they are there for me. What does that mean? Well, that he protects you from wolves, from, from those people who would want to destroy your faith. He protects you from them. And he also looks at your life on any given day and says, hey, come here for a minute. I need to check out your wool. Isn't that always a pleasant thing? You know, God, don't, don't look too closely. Or God, please look. He puts the rod in. And he begins to move the, the wool around. He goes, I, I see some sin here. We need to, to deal with. And let me, let me help you with that. What is a staff for? The staff is there to uh, uh, protect the sheep uh, as well because it's long and it's got a crook on the end of it. But also when a sheep is lost, uh, uh, the Lord can reach down with that hook and grab the little sheep and pull it out of a place that's da- dangerous when the sheep is wayward. See, this, the rod in my estimation speaks of the word of God. It's, it's like that which gets our attention. Uh, and, and, and calls us to follow God above all things. The author of Hebrews says, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, heavenly rest, lest anyone fall according to the example of disobedience of the Israelites in the wilderness. For the word of God is what? It's living, it's powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing e- in, even to the division of the soul and the spirit, the joints of the marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart, and there is no creature hidden in his sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him, to him whom we must give account one day. I mean, I get paid for a living to read the Bible. I mean, it's the greatest job in all the world, to read the Bible and teach the Bible. Uh, but you would think, since I do it all week, that I, I wouldn't do it 
you know, when I didn't really have to. But when I got up this morning, and I'm going to preach this morning, and I got up early, what's the first thing I did? I opened my Bible, and I start reading, just for my own soul. I started reading Ezekiel 1, the, the, the greatness of God's presence when Ezekiel was allowed to see into heaven and see what the throne of God looked like. And you, you read those first couple of chapters, which I did this morning, and, and God uses that to get your attention. Sometimes it's like a rod, or sometimes it's like a staff that saves you. He's always there to rescue. He says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. God's shifting here. When I was in school at learning how to speak at Dallas Seminary, they said, never mix metaphors. Bad thing to do, mixing metaphors. So he starts out with God as a shepherd, and now he's talking about God as a host. He's like the ultimate dinner host. And he says, what does God as a, as, a, as a dinner host do? Well, he prepares a table for me to eat from in the presence of my enemies. This is interesting. So forgive God for mixing metaphors, correct? Or are you going to ask him, what were you thinking? He's the ultimate host. Have you not shown up at a place before when you had a really bad host? And you're thinking, what in the world? Don't they know how to put a meal together and make it exquisite and nice? You know, when you think about God, he's the ultimate host. Uh, it's an amazing metaphor. He, he prepares a banquet for you when your enemies are all around you. Well, what does this mean? What is the banquet? Again, think of verse 6. He's talking about the worship of God in the temple. And he says, when I think about my life, when I get to the worship of God in the temple, it's like a feast there. It's like you spread out a feast for me in the temple, and you're feeding my soul through the worship and the singing and through the word of God. I get fed there while my enemies are trying to destroy me all about God. You prepare me to go take them on. Is that not what worship is? Is that not what this building has been for 31 years? It's been like a giant, beautiful, gorgeous table that when you come in to worship, God says, hey, sit down. I've got a wonderful meal planned for you. Uh, and, and partake. And partake. And sometimes that meal is a song and the words that you hear feed the soul. Sometimes it's, it's the word of God. Sometimes it's both. Uh, where God tells you, there might be many enemies outside this building, but when you come to this place of worship, uh, I'm going to feed you and prepare you to take them on. He says, you anoint my head with oil as the, as the shepherd and my cup, it runs over. At your dinner table, God, you anoint my head. This is a Jewish custom. When you came into a Jewish home, they would anoint your head with oil. Now, I don't know if it was Wesson, Crisco, like, I don't know what they use. Vegetable oil, take that up with God. It's not a significant question. They would anoint you with oil because the oil represented the Holy Spirit and also represented great joy as you came to dinner and to dine. And he says, God, you've anointed my head with oil coming to your dinner table so much so that my cup, when I look at it, you, you have just poured and poured into my cup. Does this mean that you as a Christian cannot look at your cup and say, my cup kind of feels kind of empty right now? Yeah. I mean, I've had it cut many times. I've looked and thought, God, man, what happened to the, the blessing? Because remember, God uses times of, of, of toughness to train the soul. But then there comes those times when God begins to pour into your cup. And he pours and he pours and he pours until it just spills out all over the plate. See, my last church that I was at for 19 years was the cup that was like not full. It was tough. Tough times prepared me to come here. The time that I've been here, I can only tell you it's only been like a cup running over from the blessing of God to the entire church. The staff, their cups are running over. Uh, the many lives that have been changed here, cups running over. As I've just looked around in, in amazement over the last 12 years, it's just been one blessing after the other. When we sat down with our new building uh, and we needed to raise $9 million for the down payment, and Darren and I are thinking, after the elders told us this, how are we going to do that? What, do you know what happened, right? Do you remember? that God's people stepped forward and gave to where more than 12 million came from the down payment. The blessing of God. I mean, it's been all over this place. As people have come to know Christ, uh, as people have grown up in their faith, it's been the blessing of God just pouring out upon this place. What's going to happen when we move over to the next place? The same person of God will give us the same provision, just in a more magnanimous fashion, because it's the way he rolls. And God tells you, lastly, don't forget my provision of goodness and mercy. They follow you all the days of your life. Goodness and mercy. He says, no matter what happens to you as a sheep walking through life, never forget to look back over your shoulder and see what's following you. No matter how bad it gets, no matter how hard, how hard it is, no matter how great the blessing is, always behind you will be two things, goodness from God and the mercy of God. 
He will always, like little sheepdogs following you down the, the walk of life, they're always going to be behind you to ultimately bless you. God says, I, I'm going to show you some goodness, and I'm going to also show you some mercy because you need some. They're always there. What is God's plan in light of his person and his provision? His plan is always the same. What does David say? And I, David, as a sheep, will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Forever. And it's not going to be boring, right? Not at all. Just to behold him in all of his glory will be enough. What is worship about? It's about getting a taste of glory. Of, of getting a taste of the power and the presence of God. Uh, and that you just have that moment. And it's mystical. I know you've had it. I've had it. As you're in worship with God's people and you, the spirit descends. And you're like, if I could just bottle this, this amazing feeling of the presence of God. And then, then it kind of goes away. But it's that consistent revelation of God where God says, I'm giving you a taste in corporate worship of what is yet to come. Much of that has happened here as God has descended on our services. And, and we want to thank him for that as a body and give him the glory. Because when we go into the next place, it's the same person of God as our shepherd has led us there. Same provisions of God. He will do the same things toward us in a, in a grander fashion. But the ultimately, what does he want from us? He wants an intimate walk with God that's maturing daily as we submit to him. Uh, I'm looking forward uh, to the next transition and what, what is, lies ahead. And God continues to be our shepherd, and you're not alone no matter what. Give God the glory. Give him thanks uh, today for 31 years in a great building. Uh, but we indeed are his church. We are his building. No matter where we are, we are his people, and he is our cornerstone. Let's give him thanks this morning. God, thank you for who you are uh, you are our shepherd. Uh, how often we do not focus on that and we get uh, as sheep wandering off all to the left and the right, not following where we should go, uh, and we forget how great you are and your provisions. Help us to remember to stay focused on your person and your wonderful provision that does come in due time. Thank you for pouring out your blessing on us uh, as a church, as individuals, and we thank you for your provision. It's, it's humbling. Uh, it is it's exciting, and it comes with a great responsibility to do your, your ministry for you in an in a even bigger way as we move into a new place of worship. But thank you for the worship in this old building and for the lives that have been changed, mine included, in Jesus' name. Amen. Good to have you in God's house today.